Yeah, hi, so thanks for joining me on this talk on reversing IoT. I noticed that um, we haven't seen that much um, source code yet, so you're going to see some today uh, during this session. Um, I'm working at Fortinet. I work there as um, a security researcher and mainly I'm trying to hunt down and uh, seek malware on strange platforms. So strange platforms can be embedded platforms, Internet of Things, as a matter of fact. And this is part of my research there. So the usual stuff, like why would be we uh, reversing IoT? Well, one of the most obvious reasons is that there are really lots of connected objects out there. I'm not going to bore you with figures, but the only figure which is really interesting there is that there are more connected objects than laptops, right? I think this is the most relevant one. And of course, because there are numerous, well, we want to check how secure they are or how insecure they are. And as a matter of fact, get prepared to viruses that could uh, happen or get onto uh, those objects, exploits, vulnerabilities, that kind of stuff there. And actually, yeah, that, that's one of the hot predictions I think I can make, is that yes, one day there will be lots of malware on Internet of Things, right? The, the only issue is that I don't know exactly when the one day is. There are already a few out of there, but it's really only like a couple. Um, we don't know how this is, when this is going to be massive. Is it in one year, in three years, or more? Right. So, we have plenty of Internet of Things that we want to look into, right? And if you start reversing an object, well, you'll see that, uh, I don't know if you've tried actually, but it's difficult. It's difficult because if you want to, don't, to reverse a smartwatch and you got, I don't know, hours of work on your smartwatch and manage to do something, well, it's not going to work on connected shoes because it will be completely different on the connected shoes. It's not going to work either on, uh, I don't know, connected doll or toothbrush, as I've got one, I've got a connected toothbrush here. Um, each time, each time you investigate a new product, it's, you have to start again from scratch because the hardware is different, the operating systems are different, the file formats are different, the communication protocols are different, everything is different. Um, also, sometimes they, they tend to be using some funky file formats or operating systems, like, well, there's Contiki, Riot, Micro-C, Honestly, who in the audience has already heard about either Contiki, Riot, or Micro-C? One, two, three, four. Four people in, in this, maybe five over there. Now, my question to those five would be, do you consider yourselves as experts in one of those? Just raise your hand. Right, okay. I didn't see any hands. Unless I'm blind, that's possible as well. But though, no. I have any way I approve my point. When you are starting to reverse those objects, well, you're going to need some kind of special skills. Those special skills are really specific. And well, most of the time, personally, I don't have those, right? And um, the communi community for Micro C or for Riot or Contiki or whatever other operating system there. Um, well, it's not so large. So you're not going to get so much information on the internet or from other people there to help you out. Plenty of, uh, of stuff. We'll talk about this one later, but this is the connected uh, toothbrush. But there's no technical documentation at all. So where do I start, right? Uh, I don't have anything. I don't have a community, a developer community to, to talk with. It's difficult. So, what I say here is that, well, when we don't know where to start, I think it's a good idea actually to start with 
uh, reversing the mobile applications of those objects. That usually happens for the connected uh, toothbrush, for instance. We've got a mobile application to check how well you have brushed your teeth. For the smart glasses there, you also have another mobile application to check where are your friends, where they are running, things like that. When you have um, a webcam, a home, uh, webcam, you have a mobile application to control the webcam, right? So you often have those mobile applications, and it's easier to, to inspect those because we have tools for those. We have, there's a large community of uh, either uh, reversers, or malware analysts, or things like that, people like that, so you can, you can exchange with those people and get some ideas. And in the worst parts, if ever, when you reverse the mobile application, you don't find anything, you're really unlucky, well, you can still resort to tearing down your, your hardware and uh, looking into it that way. So we're at area 41. I'm not going to talk too much about the theory, but ra rather about practice. I tried this technique on three different uh, connected objects. So this is the connected toothbrush. I tried it on smart glasses there. And hope safety alarm. Couldn't break that one, of course. But we're going to try on those. So. The connected toothbrush, well, what's the goal of it? Well, um, basically, um, you have a mobile application which will tell the end user if he brushed correctly his teeth, if he brushed all his teeth, all four parts, upper, uh, down left, down right, upper, uh, upper teeth. You also have some challenges. So uh, it's kind of a way to get some incentive for the people. Uh, if you brush your teeth more than two minutes in a row, you're going to earn a virtual star. And, well, that will probably make you happy. That's the goal of, uh, of this toothbrush right, right there. So we'll get into reversing the mobile applications that come with it. First thing which is interesting to look into is the SQL tables or databases that you might find there, because this is where all your data is located, right? So if you want to know what data is being stored on your behalf, um, if it's private, personal, sensitive in, in either way, it's really a, a good way to, to check this. So here it's a night approach screenshot of the iOS uh, mobile application. If you just quickly want to list all the tables that you've got in the database, just look for the, the keyword primary key and you get them all. I don't know if you can read at the back end there, but well, you've got a table, for instance, a brush event, client device, discount policy, insured, things like that. And if you want to get more details, you want, for instance, to get each column of the table. Well, you go and inspect the code, and there you look for a function which is called mappings. And in that mappings uh, function, well, you actually have the mapping with between the column and its name. So in that case here, we see first name is one of the columns of the, um, of the table. And you can do that on all the tables you have in the application. And basically, you get the whole map of all the data you have, which is stored on the, on the phone. So for instance, we've got a table called insured. Primary, primary key is insured ID with title, primary name, middle initial, last name, post name, relation to policyholder, gender, date of birth, user ID, sequence number. More. Um, what you can also seek by looking into the code, uh, or well, more exactly the disassembly, is um, the implementation design. So then in that case, you have a look, uh, especially in the Objective-C segment, at the end, uh, most of the time of the code, and you can list for a given class all its methods. So this is the BT firmware updater class, and we get all the list of methods which are there. 
we can also get all the instance variables for this class. And we even get the name of the variables, but also their type. So this is really very uh, helpful. And from that, well, again, it takes a little bit of time, of course, but you, you can reconstruct the implementation data design of the application and, and understand a little bit more how the connected toothbrush is working. So what did we learn in this case? Well, um, you see here on the bottom left, we've got a class called BT firmware updater, obviously Bluetooth firmware updater, so it means that we can change the firmware on the toothbrush. Um, we see that this firmware is like just a sequence of bytes, and it is being sent, and they just check if um, all the bytes have been pushed to the, um, to the connected toothbrush. Um, we see that there's an over-the-air service for that, an over-the-air control point. In, in the other class, BT brush data, which is on the right-hand side there, well, what you learn here is that there's an accelerometer, a gyroscope. Well, it's cool. We didn't even have to open it. And, you know, opening it, you, you need always have a risk to ruin the, the object. We didn't even have to do that we know a little bit more what's inside it. So yeah, um, well, this is a little bit more time for a demo. So this toothbrush here is uh, answering, well, supports to Bluetooth low energy. So what we can do is we can scan it to see uh, what are all the primary services which are open on the toothbrush and see um, what we can possibly interact with, right? Okay, so there's plenty of things there. Oh, there's a nice smart words. Uh, in the audience. Um, that one. Uh, if you want to hand it over for me to for hacking afterwards, please do. <laughs> uh, it's this one. This is my toothbrush there, right? So um, we are going to connect to the toothbrush. Now, I'm very sorry, but I hate the trackpad of my laptop, so I hope this will work. There. Connect. We're connected. And then we can list primary services. So we've got like six different services. And for those services, well, it's not really, don't have much of an explanation there. But you've got the UUIDs, uh, the identifiers for those services. If you're a little bit more accustomed to Bluetooth, you might know that like the first three are like standard services, while the other, the, the bottom three are uh, custom services there. You can also list what they call characteristics, characteristics, there we go. and you get a full list there, right? So you know there is plenty of things you can interact with, but honestly, it's not that easy yet to know exactly uh, which service I'm going to talk with and how I'm going to do that. And that's where, again, having a look in your favorite mobile application is really interesting. Here, this is actually the um, kind of uh, decompiler for uh, the Android application. We see here, set motor speed. It is sending some information to this primary service and this characteristic there. So we know now that this number there is to set the motor speed of the toothbrush. Up here, we know that this identifier here is to set the quadrant buzz. The quadrant buzz is, um, well, a buzzer that will buzz if you correctly brush all four parts of your mouth. Very interesting, right? So, 
I built a small uh, hacking tool that will set on my own the motor speed for the toothbrush, right? So let me get to the right directory. And there it is. It's a Python code. And basically what it does is just talk to the right identifier and send it uh, some values. Now, I'm not sending like uh, random values. I checked the code and so, oh, this is what I should send if I want the lowest motor uh, speed and this is the value for the maximum motor speed, things like that. And in between, I can set like intermediate motor speeds there. So we're gonna set it to uh, lower motor speed. So to turn it on, it's the big button there. There's only one button, it's not very difficult. And it was previously to zero, I'm sending it to zero now. I'm sending it to full speed. It's immediate, well, and it works. But what I'm, I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hand you over the, um, the toothbrush and write a short script there and uh, have the mortar uh, speed uh, change a little bit every seconds or something like that so you can see the difference for yourselves while the program is running. So, well, I think up to 200 will be, oops, will be far enough. So, first I set it to lowest speed. Then intermediate speed, like And full speed ahead. Um. So yeah, you can have it. Uh, please, of course, give it back at the end. Uh, if you press the button, it will turn it off, but that doesn't matter. You can turn it off, on back again and see the difference. And meanwhile, it's running. I'm going to continue the slides, of course. So there I said, well, you can uh, figure out that way using the code um, what each identifier is, um, motor speed, uh, motor speed, battery level. You even have an indicator for the brush color in case you have problems with color. Well, you can get it through Bluetooth. Um, you can get the, the, the accelerometer data that way as well. Well, basically uh, lots of information from here. So that's the end for this, this example, but basically I think we learned pretty much through the mobile application. We learned, for instance, that well, we can communicate with the toothbrush using Bluetooth low energy and we know how to get the battery level, how to change the motor speed. We know as well inspecting the implementation design that the stars, the virtual stars there, well, they are not stored on the toothbrush themselves, but on the smartphone only. So if you want to hack the virtual rewards, well, it's useless to open up the toothbrush. That's not going to work. Um, there's also a list of uh, dentists which are affi affiliated to uh, this um, connected uh, program. And well, that uh, list of dentists, well, if you check it up, it's neither on the toothbrush nor on the smartphone but on the remote servers of uh, the manufacturer. So you learn really quite a couple of things. Now, this is really cool, and I had lots of fun, right? But uh, especially for my bosses or for many security people, um, the, the immediate question is, okay, 
but people, or well, more exactly, attackers don't care about your teeth. And this is absolutely true. But you're missing the point, because it's, indeed, it's not necessarily the teeth they were after, but some other things that the toothbrush may carry. So let me investigate a few scenarios that might be interesting for an attacker, even here in the case of a toothbrush, right? First, well, targeted information, targeted business. It sometimes may be legal, sometimes not, le uh, not legal, it depends. But the mere fact that you own a toothbrush makes you like a wealthy, high-tech end user and somebody who cares about his health or her health. So, well, we can send you some uh, advertisements on health plans, for instance, right? There's always some information there. Uh, it's also the, um, the source for information for spyware, right? This is not legal. Another scenario, well, uh, this one is for ransomware. Now, just think if uh, this um, toothbrush, connected toothbrush, is uh, owned by one of your kids and so the attacker sends, okay, give me five bucks or I tell your mom you're not pressure your teeth. Well, I don't know, but on my kid, probably it would work. Well, he doesn't have any pocket money, so it won't, but it could. So it's probably efficient, low revenue, of course, in that case, because, um, well, kids are not probably not going to have that much money, but still, it's something possible, and it's really a very um, attractive scenario for other connected objects, other IoT. The undeserved rewards. I told you they were virtual stars. Um, well, it turns out that in each cases I have already investigated in the past concerning virtual rewards, there are always, at some point, some um, ways to turn the virtual rewards in something which is cash, right? And when there is cash, then attackers are interested, right? So this happens. Uh, in the case, in the particular case of the toothbrush, there's another um, interest there, is insurance fraud. Because actually the toothbrush is manufactured by a dental insurance. So you affiliate to your dental insurance and they hand you over this connected toothbrush along with some uh, toothpaste and they tell you, uh, well, okay, you're brushing your teeth correctly or not or whatever, right? And, well, they say, of course, that if you don't brush your teeth correctly, it's not going to impact uh, how much you're going to pay, but what are they going to do with the information if they're not going to use it? Ask me. So watch for this in the future. And then finally, the toothbrush could indeed not be interesting at all for the attacker, but still be, can be used to infect some other devices elsewhere. It would, could be just like a transportation method for a virus to, or worm to uh, go and infect some other devices there. This is something you really have to watch for in the future because uh, especially as there are numerous con uh, connected devices out there, if some of them start and begin to be connected and to be propagating a virus, we're gonna have a real problem. Okay, so now let's talk about those cycling and running glasses. Um, well, after the talk, uh, feel free, of course, to, to come and see them uh, more, uh, yeah, more closely. Um, those are designed for cycling and running, so they will tell you uh, at what pace you are running. If you are heading in the right direction, you have a small map that will display here. Um, if you have friends nearby which are also running in the same direction. So yeah, it's pretty cool. The cool thing for a, river, uh, a reverse engineer here is that they are running Android. So it's just like, you know, hacking into a smartphone. I can just uh, set here uh, the Android and say, okay, I enable USB debugging and I can get a shell 
on the smart glasses. Like, I like that, getting a shell on smart glasses, it's, it's fun, awesome. And when you have a shell on your glasses, well, you can get the system properties. So you can know, for instance, that it's running Android 4.1.2. Um, you can have a look at um, all the hardware which is on board. You don't, you don't even have to open up the glasses and ruin your, like, well, they're expensive, so you don't really want to ruin them, do you? Um, you just have to dig in the information and look in the files on the Android file system. You know, there's an accelerometer, there's a compass, there's a pressure sensor, there's a temperature sensor, there's um, a, a special recon instrument free fall sensor that looks like it uh, senses when you are, like, uh, falling an ambient light sensor, things like that. So that's, that's really cool. And you can have a look also at uh, some other directories. So system app, that's where your system applications are stored. And wow, there you see plenty of applications. That's really uh, very interesting again. So let me head for the next demo. Oh, it looks like uh, this one is still working, okay. Uh, I'm gonna make this bigger. Bigger again. Is that okay? Ah, complain if it's not, right. So, um, well, this is really simple. I'm gonna connect to the glasses. Okay. They're off. There they are. So that's the serial number actually of the of the glasses. There we go. I'm on the glasses, right? So I can inspect whatever directory I might be interested in. Let's say system applications. Those are just a whole list of all the system applications we've got on those glasses, right? So, interesting, we've got applications. Well, of course I'll be reversing them, of course, that's, that's one fact. But the other thing is that, well, if they have applications on board, maybe I could add my own applications on, on the glasses, right? And that's what I did with um, this application there. I wrote something that um, would be like a very basic ransomware um, proof of concept. It's just like toasting a message on the, on the smart glass and you can figure out whatever message, ransomware message it would be sending, and, and that's all. Just to see if it would be possible to install an application and have it interact with the glasses. So, coding the application, it's really simple. I'm just using the toast um, classes of Android. I'm going first to install the application, and then I will toast this message, ugly ransomware message, right? And then as, well, I can't have you, all of you see at the same time the glasses, what I'm doing is I'm capturing the image that you actually see here, and I will display it on my screen there, and there afterwards, of course. So, make install. It's installing. It works. Now, toasting the message. Now let me make this bigger. Yeah. Okay, so it displays the message that, that way. So what does it mean be, be beyond this, like a very simplistic uh, proof of concept? It means that you can install and have anybody uh, put any application he wants on their smart glasses. And of course, those uh, applications may be malicious or not, depending on what, which are your goals there, right? Let's 
let's go back to the, um, the slides. So after that, what I did, of course, is inspect those system applications. And that's how I run into um, a data leak. What happens is that from time to time, well, when you are synchronizing those uh, smart glasses with the remote servers, they actually connect all the events which occurred, like when you started running, when you stopped, when you tar started cycling, where you were heading to, what's the battery level, what's the, syst the system logs, all that stuff. They collect that, they zip it, and they zip it and protect the zip with a hard-coded password, and they send that over to recon instrument servers uh, at the other end. Now, the, the information which is being sent is partially sensitive. Battery level isn't that sensitive, but Perhaps you do not want anybody to know exactly when you started running, when you started cycling, uh, especially if you were supposed to be at work, right, for instance. Um, so the problem here is that uh, the information is uh, encrypted with a hard-coded password, which means that it's totally mm, counterproductive. If you're the standard end user and well, what happens is that you won't be able to read your own data because you don't know how to get that password because you're not skilled in reverse engineering, right? So you won't get it. But the attacker, supposedly a little bit more skilled in reverse engineering, will be able to get that hard-coded password without much difficulty and will get all your data. So you're not secure, you're secure against yourself, but not against the attacker. That's exactly the opposite we'd like, right? So that's typically uh, the kind of information you can find in, uh, in those zips. So yeah, it's more like here we say, we saw I, st I stopped uh, using um, the smartphone uh, notification on the, on the glasses there. Of course, we notified the, um, the vulnerability to the vendor Actually, it was a while ago when they fixed it, so it's been fixed since uh, February. Although, to be honest, the fix, their fix was a bit quick because their solution was just simply to remove the password in both cases. But at least that way, it's true, it's not secure. The same way for the attacker and for the end user. A little bit better. So, that's all for the smart glasses now. Let's head for home safety alarm. So in this uh, home safety alarm, the, the goal, of course, is well, to protect your house against uh, burglars, right? And like plenty of uh, home safety alarms now, well, they are controllable by SMS. So which means that if you want to, I don't know, set the alarm for this or that zone, well, you can. You just have to type in the SMS, send, uh, comply to a strict format there, send your password, and it will eventually, in the end, uh, work and uh, set the alarm on or off, depending what you want. Because the format, the format for the SMS is really uh, like um, very strict. If you forget a semicolon, it's not going to work for instance, because it's very strict, uh, the manufacturer thought it would be a good idea to, uh, to implement an Android application and make it more kind of usable. And in that case, well, you just like press on the red button there if you want your house secure and or on the green button if you want to enter and have no problems, for instance. So that's what they did, and indeed, it's far more easy to, to control that way. But if you use it, there's one problem, at least. Well, if you go and look in the outbox on the smartphone, what happens is that you actually see your SMS. The SMS to the, uh, to the, uh, the home safety alarm, and those SMS have your password, and the phone number of the alarm. So if an attacker gets those SMS, well, that attacker can basically control your home alarm without any problem. It's 
just remotely. They can set it on, set it off, do whatever they like with it. They've got full control. Now, let's suppose you are wise, and knowing this, you erase the, the SMS from the outbox. Right. Well, still, there is a slight risk, but it's because if you have a malware on your Android phone, it's quite easy for many um, Android malware, we've already seen that, that they grab the SMS actually before you actually see it, so they could be removing it themselves and reading it. So there's still a risk. Let's say you're not infected and you manually erase the SMS so that you don't have that risk, at least. Well, I inspected the application, and uh, for the application to, to work, uh, of course, you've got to, uh, to provide at first, well, the phone number of your alarm, um, the password, and some uh, various settings, right? And all those very sensitive settings are stored in a file which is protected with poor cryptography. Right, handmade cryptography. I, I'm not even sure we could call it crypto, actually, because really it's so poor. But, well, so it's extremely simple, just you know, reading the source code there afterwards, the disassembly, to work out how to uh, recover the password and the phone number and all the sensitive data from, uh, from that. That's what I did, but uh, it's really not, I'm not a genius there, it's really kind of simple. I'm going to show you. So, yeah, that's, um, uh, that's the settings of the alarm. Perhaps a little bit more, a bit better to read like that. They're kind of encrypted. And using this uh, standalone program, we're gonna decrypt them. And we get the phone number uh, of the alarm, the password, uh, the delay before it gets uh, sets off, the emergency phone to call if somebody enters, the, all the um, all the settings for the for their home safety alarm, right? And it's extremely quick to do. So, oh, let me grab some water. What happens here is that actually um, the mobile application is counterproductive in terms of security. If you are not using the mobile application, you have one security issue, the SMS in the outbox. If you are using the application, you have two security issues, the SMS in the outbox and the fact that the, all the credentials are weakly protected in that uh, parameters file, right? So, well, the conclusion is really simple there. Don't use this application, right? Yeah, by the way, we notified the vendor and we had no answer at all. So, I think you hopefully got the message. Um, if you want to do some reversing on Internet of Things, well, Really, it's useful. Do try and get the mobile application and do try and get some hints from there, right? Um, and then, after that, at least you will probably have um, learned much from there and you will be do some wiser hacking on the hardware or sniff uh, the communication protocols in a wiser way. That should really help you out. And, um, three uh, cases I've shown today. It proved out to be really useful. We identified vulnerabilities that way. We uh, understand how to communicate with some of the devices. Uh, we know what is in the hardware. Sometimes we even know the, the brand and the precise uh, chip model for what is inside without even having to open the, the device. So it's really useful. And if you're an IoT vendor, well, you perhaps wonder, well, what can I do about, uh, about that? Well, let's start with what you should not be doing. First is 
don't underestimate your device. So don't think that uh, there's nothing inter not interesting on your device because an attacker has different goals than you have, right? So it's not because it's not interesting to you or not interesting to normal people that it's not interesting to an attacker. The other thing also is um, I fear that sometime that presenting some a talk like that about the, the use of reversing mobile code would bring uh, vendors in saying, okay, well now that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna obfuscate my code. Well, uh, let me say it if you do it. If you do only that, at least it's plainly stupid, of course, because there has been uh, much documentation about that, but security through obscurity has never worked. We all know that. What you can do if you do it, at least, is rather do the other part, is fully integrate the security from the beginning, because it's easier if you do it from the beginning that uh, you just have to catch up and put some security on something where it hasn't been intended to go. And also, if um, you have designed some connected object, well, do you think about the security of your mobile application? I mean, the case for that home safety alarm, this is, uh, well, this is really alarming. Um, they, they are breaking the security of this home safety alarm just with one mobile application. That's really poor, right? And then, of course, well, you, you can, of course, get some help from security researchers, or you consider open sourcing the code so that you can get some other help from uh, other people in the community who, who will inspect the code or tell you, oh, this is good, this is bad. You'll, you'll get some feedback, at, le at least. And uh, yeah, by the way, I thank, well, for this. So the, the toothbrush is manufactured by uh, Beam Technologies, and they provided me with a free test account with the toothbrush. Uh, to be honest, when I bought the toothbrush, I thought uh, it would work uh, straight over, but it did not. So I had to get that free account to at least be able to do something with the toothbrush. And Recon Instruments is manufacturing those glasses. And again, yeah, I thank them as well for being really uh, very responsive to uh, vulnerabilities, uh, I send them over. So that, that's good work, yeah. Finally, before I finish, and you perhaps have a few questions, um, there is a, a quiz at Fortinet's booth, which is like well, across uh, the wall over there, with some nice prizes to, to win, like looks like a drone to me. Um, I'm not sure, but that's something. I'm not sure you'll be able to uh, flash the QR code from there, but you've got at least the, the tiny URL, so maybe that will uh, work out. And, um, well, that's about all. But if you do have questions, I'm ready to take them in, of course. Uh, hi. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding the data leakage scenario on the recon glasses. Um, you said that there was an HTTPS request made to the backend with the information. Uh, were they validating the certificates correctly? Um, I'm not sure I, I got to complete the question. I'll repeat and you'll, you'll tell me. So um, in this vulnerability here, um, yes, all the, um, all the information which is sent is zipped, and then it is sent over to remote servers through HTTPS. Yeah, is that right. the question, the, right? Okay. Yes, basically, the, the vector here is uh, basically a man-in-the-middle attack. But the, my question is, uh, is the, the application on the glass side uh, validating correctly the certificates because if they are, the, the man in the middle attack is not going to work. That's my question. All right, okay. I haven't checked the, fer the certificate, so okay. um, I'd be answering nonsense, but uh, it's a very good question, and I will check it, of course. Okay. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Any other, other questions? questions? No? Okay, so thank you again, our speaker. Thank you. And uh, now we have a break, and we'll see 4.30, ready to start again. Thank you. <laughs>